to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. We're going to be uh, looking at the section of scripture of Romans chapter 4 verses 18 to 25. Well, happy Easter. Uh, I'm glad to see everyone. If you were with us at the uh, at the sunrise service, which I keep calling the candlelight service, which was not candlelight, it was sunrise. If you were at the sunrise service, then uh, good morning again. Uh, it feels like uh, we've uh, been together for days. <laughs> but we haven't. But it was early. I think I'm going to pray next year that the Lord would cause the sunrise to be about 8. In that way, we can have sunrise service a bit later, but... That's okay. You know, we'll do what we can. But this morning, of course, we are celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. With, of course, today being a great focus upon uh, the resurrection. And, of course, as I said earlier, we do celebrate the resurrection 52 times a year. Every time that we gather together on the Lord's Day, on Sunday instead of Saturday, we are, we are celebrating the resurrection uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so... In many ways, we have 52 uh, Easter celebrations a year, but of course, today, this day, is the day that we set aside specifically to focus on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what I want you to understand this morning is that principally Easter is about how unholy sinners, like ourselves, can ever be reconciled with an infinitely holy God. Easter is principally not about a bunny, it's not about baskets or even Easter eggs, things that are, are fun to do with our family. Easter is about how unholy sinners, that means people who have a sin nature, people who commit sins, people who have rebelled against God, how unholy sinners like us, like you, and like me can be reconciled to an infinitely holy God. And the events surrounding Easter are God's answer to this dilemma. Now, of course, these are events that God put into motion before the foundation of the world. These are things that He decreed before He ever created in eternity past. And at the proper time, He manifested these, these realities that we're celebrating this morning in the, the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, His plan to redeem Himself a people from every tribe, from every tongue, and from every nation. Now this is something that we are powerless to do for ourselves, to reconcile ourselves to a holy God. It is, it is infinitely impossible for us to do that. And what I mean by that is, if every person, all of humanity, from the creation of Adam, or really since the fall of Adam, if we were every hour of every day trying to reconcile ourselves with God, you understand that we would be no closer at the end of the day than we were at the beginning. We have no power. Humanity has no power within themselves to reconcile themselves to a holy God. We had no chance at all. And you see, our sin is a cosmic problem. It's something that affected the entire created order. It didn't just affect human beings. Whenever Adam and Eve fell in the garden, sin and death entered into the world, and it affected all of reality. In Romans chapter 8, Paul tells us that all of creation is groaning together like childbirth, waiting for the redemption of our bodies, waiting for the fullness of our salvation at the return of Christ. You see, it's a cosmic problem that can only be remedied by a divine solution. And that's what we're going to be studying this morning, is this divine solution to this cosmic problem. And this morning in our passage, the Apostle Paul is going to sort of outline this universal problem, something that he does in really Romans 1 through 3, and he's going to summarize God's solution and the means by which we can lay hold of that solution. In other words, he will show us or we will study what is the solution to this great dilemma of sinners needing to be reconciled to a holy God and how can we lay hold of that salvation. And so let's read Romans chapter 4 and we're going to read 
verses 13 through 25, but we're really just going to study verses 23 through 25 or 18 through 25. So let's read this together. Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, God's word begins and says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope. That he should become the father of many nations, as he has been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him, made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Paul quoting from Genesis. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us, that is the righteousness of faith. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised the, from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. Let's pray this morning and let's ask God's assistance and His blessing as we study His Holy Word together. Our Father in Heaven, Lord, we come to You this morning with our Bibles open. And Father, we pray that through the power of Your Holy Spirit that You would show us, teach us, help us to behold wondrous things from Your Word. Father, we know that we, or we uh, worship rather a, a risen Savior. And Father, because of that, we have an eternal hope. And so, Father, this morning we pray that as we study these realities, Father, that you would give us strength, give us courage, give us encouragement, fill our hearts with hope and joy. Father, for those who don't know you here this morning, Father, we pray that they would see their own sin, that they would understand in the power of your Holy Spirit that they are, in fact, sinners condemned to hell. And they would see Jesus lifted high. That they would look upon Him and they would live. That they would trust in Him and Him alone for salvation. Father, we pray for these things knowing only You have the power to do them. And we pray for them from You in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first thing that I want us to understand is the bad news. Because in many ways, you can't understand the good news of what Christ has done unless you first understand the bad news of the state of all of humanity. And the first thing that I want us to see this morning is that all humanity stands condemned before God. All humanity stands condemned before God. And I'm going to read to you Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20, which is really just the summation of what Paul has expressed in Romans chapters 1 all the way through verse 3, where he talks about the state of humanity, that he talks specifically about the state of both Jews and Gentiles, that both of them equally together are condemned before God because of their sin nature and because of the manifestation of their sins. This is where Paul begins in verse 9 of chapter 3. He says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. 
And here is the final condemnation. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in His sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. You see, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, God told them if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then they would surely die. And what we must understand is that the moment they tasted that fruit, God declared them guilty. And since Adam was the representative of the whole human race, all humanity was declared guilty in Him. In Romans chapter 5, verses 12 and 18, Paul will continue talking about this theme. And he says, sin came into the world through one man. And death through sin. And so death spread to all men. Because all sin. And then in verse 18, one trespass led to condemnation for all men. The reality of it is, because we are all heirs of Adam, we have received Adam's sin nature. We commit sin, and since we are sinners by nature and by action, it is impossible for us to redeem ourselves. You see, principally, we are not sinners because we commit sin. We commit sin because we are sinners. You see, the problem with lost humanity, with us in general as humanity, those who are outside of Christ, the problem is not principally their actions. It's their nature. You see, we commit sin. That is just manifestations of our sin nature. You see, the problem is not on the outside. The problem runs much deeper. The problem is already in our, or all the way deep into our hearts. And think about this. Think about even if we were not condemned in Adam, even if we were born totally neutral, some will argue and say, well, I don't like that idea that I was condemned by, by one man's sin. Well, you would if you understood that you could be redeemed by one man's obedience. But that's another story. But the reality is, even if you could argue, I was born neutral. I had no uh, sin nature. The verdict that was hanging over me, it was, it was not on me, right? I was born neutral. Everything was in lim limbo. We would still all be condemned because of our sins, wouldn't we? I mean, can any of you honestly, honestly, stand up here and say, I have never sinned before, not once, never in my life have I ever committed a sin? Is there anyone who could stand before anyone and make that claim? Of course not. So even if we were not condemned in the Garden of Eden, even if God had not declared the entire human race guilty of sin, even if we had not inherited the sin nature of Adam, we by our actions would still stand condemned before an infinitely holy God. And the reality is, even being as religious as you possibly can will get you no closer to saving yourself. Even being as religious as you possibly can will get you no closer to being saved than active rejection of God. That's why Paul tells us in Romans 3.20, For by works of the law, no human being, no human being will be justified in his sight. He says in Galatians 3.10, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. And worse than that, beloved, is that not only are we separated from a holy God, we, in our lost condition, we don't even want reconciliation with God. Look at verse 11. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Or in verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Some say, well, what about those who are religious, those religious people who appear to seek for God, but in their own way, in their own religion? Don't you understand this only serves to make the point even more plainly? The thing about humanity is that we were created to worship and glorify God. And since this is something that God has put within us, this is not something that we can simply turn off. It is intrinsic to every human everywhere. So what do we do whenever we desire to worship something? Well, in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 25, 
we read this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Now listen. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. See, we are condemned in Adam. And in our fallen nature, we even bring more wrath upon us because rather than turn to the true and living God, we create <coughs> idols for ourselves to worship and throw ourselves at things that are created. Some of you may be saying at this point, well, this sounds hopeless. What hope do I have? If I could never be good enough, if I could never be good enough or do enough religious things to merit or earn God's favor or merit or earn reconciliation, what hope do I have? Well, enter the passage for this morning. You see, the beautiful thing about our God is that He has not left us in this hopeless condition without a way to Him. In fact, as we will see in our passage this morning, God is so gracious and so kind that the way He made a way to Himself is by coming Himself in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of the Father, the second member of the Trinity, to die in our place to be raised as a demonstration of the finality of His work on our behalf. Which leads to our passage this morning. In verses 23 through 25, we'll work through this and then we'll bounce back up at 18 and come back down. But the first thing that I want us to see is that our sin debt was paid by a sinless substitute. Our sin debt was paid by a sinless substitute. Look what he says in verses 23 through 25. But the words that were counted to him, or it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in, who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. Here it is. Who was delivered up for our trespasses. You see, through the history of God's people, God had put into place a sacrificial system. In all of the sacrifices in the Old Covenant, they pointed to this once-for-all sacrifice. In Hebrews 10, 14, it says, For by a single offering He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Or Hebrews 10, 17, speaking about Christ's sacrifice, God says, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. To which the author of Hebrews reminds us, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. You see, He was delivered up for our trespasses. You see, Him dying on the cross was about substitution. It was a substitutionary death. And I want you to understand that it was our sin that made the sacrifice of Christ necessary. Jesus didn't just come to be a great example or to give us moral teaching so that we can learn to be better people or so that we can see what it really means to be a, a servant. Yes, all of these things are true, but understand that when He came, He came to be our substitute. And it was your sin, my sin, that made this necessary. And I want us to move beyond simply thinking of this in abstract terms. I don't want us to leave this in the abstract. Listen, the sins that you have committed as a manifestation of your sin nature made the sacrifice of Christ necessary. The sinful actions that you have committed, the sinful thoughts, the sinful deeds, the sinful attitudes, the rebellion against God, those things that you have done that, that perhaps no one else knows about made the sacrifice of God's Son necessary. But He was delivered up, wasn't it? That's what He says here. He, he delivered up. He, he was delivered up for our 
trespasses. And you need to understand that it was God the Father who laid upon him our sins. This is what it means. It's in passive here. Who was delivered up. He was delivered up, right? It was God the Father who laid upon him our sins. Which is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we could become, or might become, the righteousness of God. And I don't want you to miss this, beloved. Listen, it says, who was delivered? God the Father delivered up His own Son for our trespasses, because of our trespasses. And I want us to be crystal clear here about what we're talking about. God the Father loved us, His people, so much that He poured out His wrath upon His Son. It was not some distant stranger. You see? It was not some unsuspecting stranger that God snatched up and put upon a cross. You see? It was not some deserving sinner that hung upon a cross. It was the holy, pure, sinless, eternal Son of God that was upon that cross. God the Father and God the Son intimately connected for all eternity. He is the eternal begotten of the Father. Eternally holy. Coexistent with the Father. It is the Son of God hanging upon the cross. Not some sinner like me. Not some sinner like you. And I don't want you to miss this. Not only did God the Father lay upon Him our sin, but Jesus willingly submitted Himself under the wrath of God. The Bible makes it very clear that Jesus willingly went to the cross. His love for His own is such that He willingly took the full measure of God's wrath for you and for me. And I don't want you to misunderstand this. God held nothing back. God the Father held nothing back. Every ounce of wrath that was due for our sins, Jesus took on the cross. What you would be paying for <coughs> for all eternity, every ounce, He poured it all out in the cup of His wrath upon His dying Son. And the reality is, brothers and sisters, the reality is, your sins will be paid for. If you are in Christ, your sins have been paid for by Christ on the cross. If you're not a Christian, then you will pay for your own sins for all eternity in hell. And some say, does God really take sin that seriously? Look what He did to His Son. Look what His Son endured. Amen. Beloved, that is what we deserved. That is what we would be receiving if it were not for the substitutionary atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing that I want us to see here is not only was He delivered up for our trespasses, but it says He was raised for our justification. So you may ask, the next logical question then is, how can we be so sure that our sins were paid for by Christ? How can we be sure that God accepted the sacrifice on our behalf? Enter the resurrection. That is how we know for sure. We can know for sure that Jesus paid the full measure of our sin debt, that it has been paid and the pathway to eternal life is found in the sacrifice of Christ alone on the cross because of the resurrection. A justification can be used in different ways. It can be used forensically, like we are justified by grace through faith alone, or it can be used to determine or to uh, dictate sort of this vindication. I think it's what he means here. R.C. Sproul says, it is God, speaking of the resurrection, it is God's demonstration to an unjust people that He accepts the payment in full for the moral debt that they have incurred. Or Robert Mounts, the two are inseparably bound together, talking about the death and the resurrection. Without His death, there would be no basis for acquittal. Without His resurrection, there would be no proof of the redemption reality of His death. Jesus Christ crucified and raised to life is God the Father's gracious provision for the sins of a fallen race. The reality is, if Jesus were to die and stay dead, He could not be our Savior. 
A dead Savior cannot possibly save anyone from death. Is this not exactly Paul's point in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? If Christ has not been raised, we are still in our sins. Those who have died before us in Christ are truly dead. And we of all people, above all people, are most to be pitied because we have in fact put our hope in a dead Messiah. But he says, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead. You see, the resurrection is the reality that changes everything. When Jesus rose from the dead, it proved everything that he promised had come to pass. It means everything, everything that he said is true. He is the Lord of all. He is the Lord. He is the Lord that David saw always at the Lord's right hand. He is the Lord of all creation. He is the eternal Son of Man from Daniel 7. He is Lord. And he conquered sin and death, didn't he? He said he would die for his own. He came to die for his sheep. He would lay down his life and then he would take it up again. No one can snatch his own life from his own hand. He will lay it down, freely take it up again. Why? To die for his sheep. So that we can live for eternity. If we live and believe in him, then we will never die. Jesus conquered sin and death and Satan on our behalf. It proved that he is, in fact, the Son of God. Something that he made very apparent through his teaching. You know what else, beloved? It proved that God had accepted the sacrifice on our behalf. And I think that's probably what he's talking about here specifically. God had accepted the sacrifice on our behalf. How do we know that God the Father is satisfied? That his wrath was satisfied upon his people or for his people? How do we know? Because he raised Jesus from the dead. Because he raised Jesus from the dead. And all of the prophecies are true, by the way. This morning we read from Luke's Gospel whenever we were at the uh, sunrise service and we saw how the Psalms and the prophets and the law all point to Jesus, to the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. All of these prophecies, 1,400 year old prophecies at the time of Christ, all of these things that were written down, all of them proved to be true when He breathed life and stepped out of that tomb. And he is, make no mistake, he is the long-awaited Messiah. And the glorious reality is, for those who repent and believe, we too will be raised bodily from the grave. Amen. How can we stand beside our, our loved ones as they are failing with unshakable hope? How can we look at, at the world around us and have an unshakable hope? How is it possible that Christians... From the beginning of the church have had an unshakable hope. It's because of the grave being broken through in the bodily resurrection of Christ. I know that if I die today and I am laid in the tomb, I'm just passing through. My soul immediately goes to be in the presence of Christ. But one day he's coming back. And one day he will call my body out of that grave. And just as sure as He is in a glorified body today interceding for us at the right hand of the Father, I too will spend all of eternity in a new heavens and a new earth in a glorified body that will never wear out, never get old. It will never ever be sick or hunger or thirst again. I will be made perfect like He is perfect. I too will be raised bodily from the grave. How do I know that? Because He lives. Amen. Amen. Because He was resurrected. So then how do we... How do we be saved? That's the next logical question, isn't it? How's our sin paid for? Well, it's paid for by the sinless substitute. How do we know that God accepted the sacrifice? Because of the resurrection. How do we make that mine? The means by which we lay hold of Christ our Savior is faith. Look in verses 18 and following. In hope, this is speaking of Abraham. In hope he believed against hope. That he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. 
No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Now look, that is why his faith was counted or reckoned to him as righteousness. You say, well, fantastic, but what about us? Well, look, but the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. And it will be counted to us who believe in Him who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord. Now I want to be careful here. And I want you to listen closely. We are not saved by faith. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ. Faith is the means by which we lay hold of Christ our Savior. And I say that because so many people say, do I have enough faith? Well that is putting your faith in faith. You put your faith in Christ. The object of your faith is Christ. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ. Faith is the means by which we lay hold of Christ our Savior. And so if you lay hold of Christ our Savior by faith, then He saves you. And Paul's point in this whole section is to show that Abraham was saved by grace through faith. And what was true of Abraham is true for us. When we place our faith and trust in Christ, God declares us righteous. He reckons or counts righteousness into our account. He reckons or counts it to you. Now, I want you to understand this. This righteousness had to come from somewhere. You say, what do you mean? Well, think about this. God does not simply dole out pretend righteousness. That would be transgressing His holy nature to simply overlook sin and never deal with it. To simply give out or give someone a pretend righteousness goes against His holy nature and His holy character. In fact, if God could just dole out pretend righteousness, then Jesus wouldn't have had to come at all. And so that leaves us with two options, doesn't it? If God can't just simply give us pretend righteousness, then that only leaves two options. You can either be declared righteous based on your own works, or you can be declared righteous based on someone else's. You either are going to stand in your own righteousness, or you will stand in an alien or foreign righteousness. Now, we have already shown that our own righteousness is inadequate. It is not good enough. Remember, by the works of the law, no man, no, not one man will be justified in his sight. We must then, by default, have a righteousness that is given to us. And listen to this. Jesus' righteousness is the righteousness we get. It is perfect righteousness. In other words, the righteousness that God requires is the righteousness that God gives us at salvation. And make no mistake about it, Abraham was only declared righteous because of the righteousness of Christ. God doesn't give pretend righteousness. And so the righteousness that God requires is the righteousness that God gives you when you come to faith in Christ. Now I want us to think about Jesus' obedience quickly as we walk through this. We all understand Jesus' active obedience. Jesus was actively obedient to the will of the Father. He was sinless. He lived a completely obedient life. In fact, He says, I did not come to do my own will, but the will of the One who sent me. He lived a sinless, obedient life. But He was also passively obedient. That is, that Jesus willingly allowed Himself to bear the wrath of God in our place. He willingly took on sin in the penalty that our sin deserved. But when we are clothed in Christ, we are clothed in His perfect obedience. So when God looks at us, He sees His Son's obedience. He sees the perfect obedience of our Lord. That's why Paul can say in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You would say to me, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the sins that I've committed. You, you don't know the things that I've said. You, you don't know the places I've been or the people that I've been around or the things that I've done to others or to God. You, you don't understand. What I do understand is that if you come to faith in Him in place of all of that, you receive the perfect righteousness of Christ. 
And what I do understand is no matter what you've done in your past, no matter what you have done, no matter what you think you can't be forgiven for, what I do understand is that when you come to faith in Christ, there is no condemnation for those that are found in Christ Jesus. Just to be perfectly clear about what I'm saying, if you are in Christ, everything you have ever done has been imputed or credited to Christ. He died and paid for all of it. All of it. And in the place of everything you have ever done, God imputes or credits to you the perfect obedience of Christ. It's the great transfer. He says that our sins, He was delivered up for our trespasses, raised for our justification. Every single sin ever committed by a child of God was paid for at the cross. Every single sin. Every one of them. And we know for sure because of the resurrection of Christ. And there will never be condemnation for those whom Christ died for. But I want to be clear here. If you reject Christ, if you reject God's grace, you will pay for your sins. You will pay for your sins for all eternity in hell. If you accept Christ, He paid for your sins. If you reject Christ, you pay for your sins. <clears throat> so you see, Easter is God's answer to how we as sinful, rebellious people can be reconciled to Him. A completely, infinitely holy God. How we can be adopted into His family. How we can spend all eternity with Him in a new heaven and a new earth. See, a cosmic problem needed a divine solution, and God, according to His eternal plan, according to His eternal decrees, did what was impossible for us to do. And so what do we do? We, as the people of God, we worship and we rest in the finished work of God the Son, our sinless substitute. And we do so in the power of God the Holy Spirit. And we do so for the glory and pleasure of God our Father. Easter is a glorious reality. And if you were to take Easter out of the Christian religion, we would have no Christianity. But beloved, He's alive. He rose from the dead. And we can know that we can have eternal life because He lives eternal. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know where you are spiritually. I know where you are physically. You're here. I can see you. But I don't know where you are spiritually. You know, some of you are, are Christians. You are truly born again. But you have walked away from the Lord. You are in the far country. You have, you have strayed from the path. And if you are truly a Christian, then God the Holy Spirit will convict you of your sins. And you know that you're not where you need to be. You're where you need to be today. But you're not spiritually where you need to be. You know, there's no greater day that I can think of to turn your life back to Christ, to repent of your sins and to come back than Easter. When that tomb broke open, new life happened. When you were saved, you are a new creation. And what better day than Easter today to give your life back over to Him. Repent of your sins and come back. You know, all you do, you drive a stake in the ground and say, Lord, I can't change what happened back there. But you know what? I'm confessing my sin to you today. And from this point on, I want to walk with you. You know, some of you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And, and you're here because in some, some way, in your mind, you're, you're trying to appease God. And you think, if, if I could just come to more services, God would be pleased with me. Or if I could just give some money in, in the blue buckets here, then God would be pleased with me. Or if I could just sing with enough sincerity, God would be pleased with me. Don't you see all of those religious works, they lead to hell, not heaven. They lead to despair, not Christ. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, listen. A substitute is possible. 
You will pay for your sins if you don't allow Christ to be the one paying for your sins. If you don't know Christ today, what you need to do is not become more religious. You need to come to Him. And you need to confess your sins to Him. You need to repent of your sins. And you need to trust in Him. Ask Him to save you. For the rest of us, who are somewhere in the middle, right? This is a good day. This is the day we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a day that we celebrate every Sunday of the year, but today is a good day. It's a day that we specifically focus on that. Why don't you spend a few moments and let's praise Him this morning. I'm going to lead us in a, a brief time of response. And whatever the Lord has laid upon your heart, whether that's sins in your life that need to be laid down and, and you need to put them to death and move past them, whether that's joining back up with a body of believers or whether that's coming to faith in Him for the first time, I want you to do whatever the Lord has laid upon your heart. Just these few minutes of response. If you're saying to yourself, you know, I know I'm a sinner, but I still don't really understand what it means to be a follower of Christ. I want you to come and I want you to talk to me. I would love to talk to you about what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Wherever you are this morning, let's lift our prayers before His throne. And let's pray to Him. Our Father in Heaven, Lord, we come to You this morning just in awe of Your grace. How You, an infinitely holy God, could send Your Son, the second member of the Trinity, our Lord Jesus Christ, to pay our sin debt after living the life that none of us could possibly live. Father, we know that in Adam all die, but in Christ all are made alive. And Father, we know that as a reality, because after he died on the cross, he was put in a tomb, but three days later, he was supernaturally, miraculously raised from the dead. And after appearing to many witnesses, up to 500 at one time, Lord, he ascended to be with you where he stands today, interceding as our great king and high priest. Father, for those of us who do know you, Lord, today is a great day. Father, for those of us who know you, Lord, we will, we will <coughs> proclaim the glories of the life, death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ for all eternity. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in here who have wandered. Father, I pray that you will draw them back today. God, I pray for those who don't know you, that today for them would be the day of salvation. As your word tells us, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Father, we know that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword that it pierces to the innermost parts of our being. And Father, we know that your word is eternal, that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word remains forever. And Father, we know that your word and the power of your spirit accomplishes the purpose with, with, with which you send it forth to accomplish. And so, Father, we pray that your word and the power of your spirit will accomplish your will in the hearts of your people. Transform us by the renewing of our minds, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.